this episode of Any Place Wild, pain and pleasure. We're traveling the historic boundary waters between America and Canada. Tranquil beauty in some of the world's most unspoiled scenery. Interrupted by grueling tests of endurance as we take on some of the toughest portages around. I'm John Beeman. Join me now for an adventure canoeing the borderline. <laughs> this is sweet. Hey, hey. I'm John Veeman. Each week from our base in Camden, Maine, Annie Getchell and I prepare for anything we might find any place wild. This week I'm packing my paddle for a trip back home. I grew up in Minnesota, but the place where I really grew up was the Boundary Waters, now a wilderness area that straddles the U.S.-Canadian border. But it's been a long time, too long since I paddled my home waters, so I decided to call my brother Tommy and another pair of brothers two canoe-crazy Canadians, Michael and Jeffrey Peak, to join me for a trip up there. We'll follow the main route of some of the earliest explorers. Any Place Wild is made possible in part by Chevy Blazer. Next time you're having fun outdoors, make sure that Mother Nature has a good day too. And by Low Alpine. And L.L. Bean providing sporting gear and apparel for people who love the outdoors for over 80 years. On this trip, we'll be traveling the dotted line, the watery boundary between the state of Minnesota and the Canadian province of Ontario. brother Tommy and I rendezvous with Michael and Jeffrey Peak on Mountain Lake at the concrete boundary marker. Well, there be the Peak brothers, eh? Hey. Welcome to Canada. Yeah. We're with Canada Customs. Please step out of your boats. We'd like to check. Step Here. out of your boats immediately, sir. <laughs> I'm Mike Peak. Mike, I'm Tom Beaver. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You're John, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you finally made it to Canada. Congratulations. Yeah. Oh, wait. Actually, we were looking for this dotted line on the map that you guys said would be here. I don't, I don't we rolled it. it up already. It's in our boat. <laughs> our trip promises to be pain and pleasure. Clear lakes and rivers and grueling portages where we have to carry our canoes, including the famous Grand Portage, the final endurance test of eight and a half miles ending at Lake Superior. In Canada, they say paddling is in the blood. And in this waterlogged country, you'd be hard pressed to find two more addicted canoeists than the Peak Brothers. Under the banner of their Hideaway Canoe Club, they've paddled thousands of miles. We've been paddling historic routes for years, and uh, part of the charm is obvious around us, the beautiful surroundings, but uh, the history is also part of it too. Going where explorers have gone and retracing their routes, and the more you learn about a route, that you're on, the more you enjoy it, and the more you get out of it. The historic route we'll be following could be called the original Trans-Canada Highway. Every major explorer, if you wanted to travel to the Western Canada, this was it. You had to pretty well paddle through this route, but they were really just following the customary routes that the Indians themselves used. Canoes were to Canada what wagon trains were to America, the way west. In 1842, when the two countries finally negotiated the boundary, they split the old canoe route right down the middle. I mean, we're paddling exactly right on, the longest undefended border in the world. And look around us, there's no uh, towns, there's no hydro wires, there's no bridges, there's no settlements. And that's a, that's a great testament to uh, two countries that are smart enough to preserve certain areas of wilderness for, for what they were and for what they will be. At the end of Mountain Lake is our first portage. Connecting this lake to the next, there's a stream too shallow for our canoes. The portage is just 150 yards, a mere hint of what's ahead. And Michael has invented his own definition of this necessary evil. Portage is from the French word torture, 
which means uh, short periods of carrying heavy loads. We use a tump system, which is the oldest carrying system known to man. The Indians used it, and the British chose not to use it because they had their own ideas. But it's the best way to carry because it puts all the weight on the skeleton as opposed to your shoulders, yeah. or your neck. We can carry all our gear usually in two trips, and if we're really good, one trip. And that saves a lot of work. Oh, bet. There's the Indian way, the British way, and my brother Tommy's way. Two packs, front and back. Now, is the word portage or portage? If you're an American, it's portage, but the actual French word is portage, which means uh, carry, of course, but when we're doing some of the longer portages, uh, I think you'll agree, it can be torture. Merci, monsieur, en avant. Lovely. Ugh. All right, Tommy, where I'm are you? I'm coming. Give me uh, a hand getting this guy off. All right, I got the back. Okay, bring it down then or something. Okay. Oh, hell. Flip it this side. Ready? Okay. <laughs> Boot sucking mud. It surely is. Oh, man. Well, there's another one down. Now, did you notice the marker over there? Yeah, what's that? Well, oh, yeah. it means that this portage, this lovely portage, is in the States. That's one of those official boundary markers. Okay, John, you ready to go? Yeah. Yeah. And we are off. Of Canada's early explorers, the most dogged had to have been David Thompson, a map maker who surveyed 80,000 miles of wilderness by horse, by foot, by snowshoe, and naturally by canoe. Now, why were Thompson's maps so important? Before he did those maps, it's hard to imagine, but there was no map of Canada. I mean, we don't realize that all those early explorers had to travel without really knowing where they were going. He finally drew a map, and for the first time in 1812, when it was unrolled, you could finally see just how big Canada was. Uh, weren't there other maps? Like, didn't the Indians have maps? Well, the Indians didn't have maps for themselves because they, they certainly knew where they were going and they didn't travel uh, right across the country. But the explorers asked the natives to provide the maps. And they would draw a map and the Europeans looked at the maps and go, oh, God, look at these maps. They're terrible. They're, the lakes are way too big. We, we know that. And the rivers are too short because we've seen parts of it. But the maps were not drawn to a distance scale. They were drawn to a time scale. So in other words, a lake would take you a lot longer to paddle than a river, which was uh, which mo had current and moved quickly. So you know, it just showed the difference between the two cultures and the way they they did business. Native Canadians and Europeans first began dealing with each other over this small creature, the beaver. From the 1600s to the early 1800s, the beaver's fine fur was coveted by hat makers throughout Europe. French-Canadian fur traders, called voyageurs, penetrated deeply into the interior, exchanging manufactured goods like cooking pots and blankets for skins. Rain or shine, the voyageurs would paddle and portage, paddle and portage, for mile after mile without complaint. In the process, they became Canada's folk heroes. So on this trip, we're traveling in the wake of the voyageurs.
Look at that. At least there's some good comes from all this rain. My kid did make me paddle to the end of that, you know, look for that gold. And it's right there. I can see it. That first night, the end of our rainbow was Fowl Island Camp on the U.S. side. Why are you carrying so much, Jeff? Are you just like, like pain or something? Oh, well, it's a good contrast to you, that's all. Yeah. Hey. Well, that looks like home to me. Oh, home, sweet home, for one night. I think we should string tarps before we do tents. Okay, that's or a point. If we do that, will it be past tense? Well, no. Oh. Oh. Yeah, just tie it off around the tree. Okay. No tape, just rope. Instant tent. Looking good. <laughs> uh, little racquetball. You ported a chopping board? Look, when are you going to stop being surprised at what we carry? The best thing about eating like this is. We don't have to carry this stuff anymore. Yep, the pass get light very quickly. And do I understand we have some monster portages coming? We only coming? have two left. Only have two portages oh, left, but two. they total They do total 10, 10 miles. miles. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you don't have to tell two, me that. But oh, only two. Look at it that way. That's the spin. And just to put the day in perspective, uh, here's a quote from uh, Explorer on uh, 1826, and it was 7 at night, which is roughly about what time we have now. Uh, and he asked the men, uh, don't you want to camp? Uh, and he said, uh, they answered, uh, they were still quite fresh yet. They'd been uh, paddling constantly since 3 o'clock this morning. 57,000 strokes with the paddle. And they were still fresh yet. No human beings except the Canadian French could stand this sort of treatment. And we ended up camping at half past 9 that night, having come 79 miles that day. So we're short a few here. I think we uh, we got another 70 miles to go. Uh, let's think. pack it up and go. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, nah, I'll stay here. Blister there? Yeah, a little maintenance. A little maintenance. A little maintenance out here in the uh, uh, underwater. Jeffrey had a little adventure. surprise last night when he took his uh, oh, two what'd leeches you find? had somehow found their way out of my foot. I nice. can't imagine under why. the straps on his sandals. Along with the cutting board, Jeffrey also likes to carry a guitar. I couldn't help wondering why he didn't try something a little smaller. You ever thought of just like taking up the harmonica or something like that? So now that would be too easy. Now, you know we don't do things the easy way. I thought you learned that. I know. I've, I've been watching. I've been learning a lot from you guys. Learning how to do <laughs> things the hard way. Learning what not to do. He's hoping we will learn. But, uh, learning how to do things well, Jeffrey the hard way. Jeffrey has his eye on that cast iron guitar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the south end of Fowl Lake, there's a promontory called Goose Rock. David Thompson, the map maker, probably climbed this right rock up, back right in 1823, up. so it didn't oh. take much arm twisting for us to climb it, too. <sighs> okay. Oh, we got a view up here, or what? Finally. Wow. Oh, man, look at this. This is worth a climb. Holy. Woo! There are the boats, way down there. 
From the top of Goose Rock, you can see why this is such great canoeing country. There's water everywhere. The bad news is you can see the portages that are coming up as well. It hurts just to look. There's the Pigeon River down there. You can just see it. That's about where the portage comes out. Just oh, so we're walking yeah. across that? Yeah, right yeah. through here. There's only two more portages. Right yeah, yeah. Go ahead and keep telling me See, that. I think you're, you're getting the hang of that now. Well, welcome to Portage Most Foul. In the boundary waters, the length of a portage is still given in rods, an old surveyor's measure equal to 16 and a half feet. Foul portage is 320 rods, exactly one mile. Every rod there are obstacles. It's a kind of canoeing steeplechase, but hey, we're walking in the footsteps of the Indians, the explorers, and the voyageurs. Here, Tom. Okay, okay. Next stop, Partridge Falls. We've left the border lakes behind. In front of us, eight miles down the meandering Pigeon River, before we reach our next camp at Partridge Falls. In paddling, as in life, there's no rest for the weary, at least not for long. The Pigeon River transforms itself from deep and placid to shallow and irritating. Back paddle. That's pretty shallow. Our predecessors had to do this in fragile birch bark canoes. Take their line. Yeah, pretty much. Watch out. Well, how can I watch out for something oh. I haven't seen? Well, just <laughs> keep your eyes open. Well, I got them open. I couldn't see you that. You never could see anything, you know? Cross drop. Go left. Look out. Keep it straight on. Drop. Get over left. Right here. Look out. <laughs> Ooh. Upstream, upstream, upstream. Okay. The water's freezing, the rocks are slippery. At every step, I have visions of a twisted ankle and a cold bath. You imagine doing this with moccasins on? Sandals are close enough, I think. And so our second day ends with another hike, not just on the portage, but down the middle of the river, too. Well, all I can say about today is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? You're, you're getting the idea. I'm, I'm feeling stronger. You. Today, I'm sure I dropped 10 pounds. Yeah. Easily. Your foot. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it's hard, there's still a basic satisfaction there just from, I mean, everything's so simple. You're, you're traveling, you're carrying your gear, you eat. Life is fairly uncomplicated. I mean, we, we talk about why we do the trips and and why? Because it is hard. I mean, you know, you get wet and it is tiring. There's no doubt about that. But I sort of was thinking that our minds and our consciousness are in the late 20th century. But our bodies evolved over thousands of years. So there's something in there that is draws us back to a more primitive uh, existence. That's why I think that so many people feel that pull to come out to the wilderness.
Hot, 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 hot. Thank you, Thomas. You get a job any time at my house washing dishes. There's always an opening. As we break camp, my brother Tommy reveals that the Peak brothers aren't the only ones with excess equipment in their packs. What's next? You ready to go? I never got a chance to wear these. Uh, that's good. Phew, that's, that's nice. a blessing. From here to Lake Superior, the Pigeon River drops through a series of unrunnable waterfalls. Instead of doing a dozen short portages, native travelers created the Grand Portage, one of the longest in North America, eight and a half miles of mud and misery. Take us just up here, I think. We've reached the head of the Grand Portage, once the site of Fort Charlotte, a fur trading post now gone. From here, the voyagers carried 90-pound bales of fur, Typically, two to a man over to Lake Superior. I am yeah. the authorized flag bearer, roll it up until we reach the lake. Ooh. Oh man, is this muck. Okay, just carry those up there, Tom. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. What? Okay. I want to be behind you. Good plan. Oh. Good plan, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's slippery. It's very slippery. Uh, yeah. It's on belay. It's right under. On belay. Allez-y. allez on. Portaging. Voyagers. This is just a short one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just keep saying that. Just don't stop till the trail ends. Long. Okay. When you see a very big lake, stop. Okay. <laughs> Water break. That's the highest point of the trail right here. We are? 1,300 feet. Can we ski from here or anything? For about, oh, the first five minutes, you don't, you don't, they don't remember anything. Well, the last time we did it, I remember there was sort of like three stages of pain. There's the first bit, the first third of the portage where you stop, it goes away. Then there's the next stage where it hurts a lot afterwards, but it's not too bad. And the last bit, it was like this, someone digging a chisel into your yeah. shoulder blades here, <laughs> and you just had to grit through it. But, well, that's nice, Jeff. I have all that to look forward to. It's, <laughs> it's like, true. you really know how to get a guy pumped up. Well, it's this whole <laughs> historical experience we're trying to give you, John. Chisel down into your shoulder blades. <laughs> Pleasant, huh? Like but it's great this has been preserved, though. You know, I face it, it's like six feet wide at the most through this huge forest that uh, remains alive. It's like a ribbon of history stretching through the forest. Part of me now. I'm one with the pack. I'm one with the pack. Howdy. Bonjour. Monsieur. We get in free if we bring our own canoe, right? A mere six hours of torture to get to the now reconstructed Grand Portage trading post on Lake Superior. All right, Jeffrey. All right. Montreal, 2,000 miles that way. I'll bet that's cold. <laughs> I am so glad to be Hold here. Hold on, Tom. Now you are a voyageur. <laughs> <laughs> This is sweet. Hey, hey. Monsieur Voyageur, I salute you. Hey, thank you, thank you. Everything, I love it. Tiny. <laughs> there you go, Tiny. <laughs>
Uh, I'm glad that's done with. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's great. Now like let's it. go back for the second load, okay? To learn more about Any Place Wild and the Great Outdoors, check out PBS online at www.pbs.org. Any Place Wild is made possible in part by Chevy Tahoe. Next time you're having fun outdoors, make sure that Mother Nature has a good day too. And by usually hangs in my office. It depicts the voyageurs. French-Canadian paddlers who, for much of the 18th and 19th centuries, ferried beaver pelts and trade goods thousands of miles across Canada. It's a painting that, for me, really captures the romantic allure of the wilderness. But, you know, every time I look at it, it makes me wonder, was the voyager life really as idyllic as it looks? Any Place Wild is made possible in part by Chevy Blazer. Next time you're having fun outdoors, make sure that Mother Nature has a good day, too. And by Low Alpine. And L.L. Bean. Providing sporting gear and apparel for people who love the outdoors for over 80 years. My trip into the past begins at the western edge of Lake Superior, near the U.S.-Canadian border. There I'm to rendezvous with a group of Canadians who delight in bringing their own history to life. This could be the dawn of almost any summer's day in the 18th century. Allez, tout le monde debout. Tout le monde debout. La journée commence. In Canada, the voyageurs have taken on a mythic quality. Imagine Paul Bunyan paddling a canoe. This group of amateur historians is testing the myth against reality, recreating the voyageurs' way of life down to the smallest detail, like using flint and steel to start the morning fire. The tang of wood smoke in the air draws me into the Voyager world, even as we arrive. Knowing there's hard paddling ahead, I've brought along my brother Tommy and two of Canada's foremost canoeists, Michael and Jeffrey Peak. Bonjour. Hey. Good morning. You must be Peter. I am Peter. I'm Laborde. John. This is Jeffrey Peak. Nice nice Michael Peak. Peter. Hi. Nice, nice to meet you. To my you. brother Tommy. Bonjour, Peter. Bonjour. Welcome. Welcome to Lake Superior. The 36-foot-long Montreal canoe we'll be paddling is a fiberglass replica of the birch bark original. <laughs> hey, we have some new recruits to help put this beast in the lake. Hey, good. Hey, and just hand over hand it down. What does this thing weigh, anyway? About 600 pounds. Oh, what a monster. Voyageur is French for traveler, and the voyageurs of the fur trade were travelers and then some. For almost 200 years, they hauled furs and trade goods the length and breadth of Canada. The voyageurs, Peter Labor likes to say, were the long-haul truck drivers of their day. All right, folks, ready to go? So watch Sean at the front, he's the avant. And the first command is préparé, and next command is en avant. And just follow the stroke of Sean at the front. In the heyday of the fur trade, Voyager canoes plied the Great Lakes from the western edge of Lake Superior, 1,200 miles to Montreal. Our trip will cover just the very beginning of the journey, from Grand Portage to Thunder Bay. A typical Montreal canoe had a crew of 10 or more. At the bow is the Avant on our boat, Sean Patterson. Behind him sit Chris Leach and Mark Wilson. The sole woman on board is Natasha Ducharme. 
The man who first got the group together is Jim Smithers, now retired from his university professorship. In the back of the boat, as befits our status, the Peaks and the Vemans. Steering is the Gubernai, Peter Labor. Coming together originally for one trip, this Voyager crew has now paddled together on many such expeditions, which explains why their paddles move in unison and mine doesn't. The Voyager paddle stroke is short and fast, kept in time by singing, Natasha's special skill. The Peak Brothers pitch right in. Well, they are Canadian. My brother Tommy fakes a few bars, but since I'm tone deaf, well, maybe that's why my paddle goes its own way. After a couple of hours on the water, So we'll get out here and have a uh, pipe break. Now, what's what's the deal with the pipe breaks? Historically, you hear of the pipe breaks as a uh, time to light, relight the pipes and continue on for the day, but it has a purpose uh, when you start paddling the boats in that it gives you a break. It's about the right period of time, once every hour and a half or two hours, so it can break up your day. You can count your day in pipes instead of hours. Today we had a six-pipe day, which would be a long day, or a four-pipe day, which would be a short day. One of the brigade members would say, allume, which is light up. All and right. It's the only... Uh, word that they needed to drop the paddles and get out the pipes. <laughs> Wouldn't take much prompting for a break. Well, these days they probably have a no smoking section in the canoe, I'm sure. <laughs> Somewhere at the back. That's why you have a funny shaped pad. Oh, path. really? Oh. Drop your pipe in there and it won't oh, get broken. Oh, really? Did Thank that reflect sort of upon certain... Uh... And then you put that on and then right. this can... Well, yours is, yours is going straight across me. <laughs> but if your hat was longer, this would come down there? the side. Is that why they wore the long, long hat? Like yeah, that? one of the reasons, yeah. Now, how come they didn't use big ships? I mean, Lake Superior is plenty big. Why would they use, you know, just big canoes like this? Because if one ship goes down, you can lose a lot more furs and a lot more trade goods than if one boat goes down. Made originally of birch bark, each Voyager canoe carried up to four tons of cargo. Westbound boats were crammed with trade goods, pots and pans, cloth, blankets, and other manufactured items. Eastbound canoes were loaded with beaver pelts on their way to the heads of the finest gentlemen in Europe, where nothing topped a hat of thick felt made from Canadian beaver fur. Pipe break over, it's back to stroke after stroke after stroke without the usual canoeist option of switching sides to rest tired muscles. We end our day coming around Pigeon Point into a protected campsite called Hole in the Wall, a full 10 miles from our starting point. Well done, Voyagers. Thank you for the first day. Successful day. So can you imagine the Voyagers had to unload all the stuff every day as well? All their fur packs, four tons worth out of the boat. Oh, oh. <laughs> the mountain of a man. <laughs> Is, what was oh, the guy's man. name? <laughs> All right. How's that, Sean? Now, would the Voyagers do this every night? Well, every night they had to take their boat out. Every night they had to set up camp, had to unload all their gear. Yeah, they slept mostly under the canoe, one form or the other. Huzzah! Huzzah! Woo -hoo! Huzzah! Is that a pretty long day, 10 miles for the... No, that would be probably the distance we do, the Voyagers would do before the first pipe break. Oh, so like before yeah, breakfast they would do? Yeah, before breakfast even, yeah. yeah. So, uh... Well, that it wasn't just too a, bad. No, it was good for us for our first day. I'm, I'm not complaining at all. We did very well. Mm. 
So here we are. These are almost done. Moccasin soup. Wow. Wow. Water. Oh, yeah. So how did our new voyageur enjoy the day today? The stroke is different, and that's setting me off a little. It's not any of the same. It's shorter. Everything's shorter. It's funny. Without even a hard stroke, you really move along. I think the hardest thing was not being able to switch. I yeah. mean, even if you don't, yeah. like, at least in a normal canoe, you have the option to switch. You know you right? can. <laughs> so, you know you can. So the idea of switching becomes that much more. But I saw you guys switch paddles in mid-stroke yeah. once. Yeah. That was yeah. a good maneuver. It's a more social experience, though, isn't it? And yeah. when you're all very well, together. there's a definite division between the front and the back oh, yeah. with the cargo oh, yeah. in the yeah, back. Yeah, well, you can't hear. That I felt like you guys were at the first class section up yeah. there, and yeah. they saw yeah. the hors d'oeuvres. The going. class. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. We, we were just <laughs> steering. Yeah. And and I think I sang more French words that I don't know what they mean. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> that I ever I was had. Waking up French words. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, um, that's good. That's oh, for all the English oh, people. Oh, <laughs> um, Superior is notorious for bad weather and today the lake is in a particularly foul mood. We leave our protective cove to face nasty whitecaps and dangerous chop in Pigeon Bay. Soon we're battling nearly six foot waves and a 20 knot wind. Sitting behind the Avant, I'm spared a good soaking, but ringing in my head is Peter Labor's cheery assertion that when a canoe went down, it lost only four tons of fur. It's a different story when your hide's on board. After an agonizing hour, we make it to shore. One, two, three. Man, oh man. Every tenth stroke, I'd like hit nothing but air. When I got done, both of my hands were numb. And uh, he said, you're gripping the paddle too hard. And I said, I know. <laughs> I'm not letting go of this damn paddle. I don't want to go, let go. <laughs> Just kicking right up there. Yeah, it's a little rough. They eh? were shipping quite a bit of water those last last few strokes. Yeah, and there's and it's coming straight off here. We've got no uh, breakage from the islands and the points. So. And above and beyond the safety, there's just not there's not much point in paddling into a headwind with everything you've got for three hours to go 200 meters when tomorrow it'll go good and fast. So, just like the voyageurs, we'll build a nice fire and we'll curl around there, yeah. sit wait and wait, wind, wait for the lake to let us paddle. When the voyageurs were windbound. Their priority was char cloth, the squares of carbonized cotton that are the key to making a fire from flint and steel. Char in there. For a voyageur, being without char cloth is like my going camping without matches. Unlike a Bic lighter that you just throw back in your pocket and use it next time, you always have to have char cloth. Just flannel ripped into squares. And since it's inside an enclosed space, it can't completely burn up to ash through a hole in there. Mm -hmm. Now we'll just put that onto the fire, mm -hmm. and after about 45 minutes, we'll take that off, let it cool a bit, and then when you take out your char cloth, you're ready to go. With the char cloth baking, most of us nap. But Jeffrey starts a baking project of his own. No sooner are the buns in the oven than the weather clears. Yeah, I'd say the wind has switched to 15 degrees, 20 degrees since we were here last night. And we'll head out. Two, two hours should get us somewhere. So you're used to being windbound, are you, Jim? Uh, yes, one of the uh, interesting things about doing these kinds of trips is that it's a good chance to check the, uh, the myth with the reality. Oh, yeah? Uh, quite often, uh, when you read about the voyagers, uh, they got up every morning at 4 o'clock, and they paddled every day until dark, which would be 11 o'clock, which meant they uh, had 20 hours of paddling. 
And 20 hours of paddling at five miles an hour is about 100 miles. In, in reality, they average 30 miles a day, so they must have spent a lot of time stopped windbound, just like we were today. Yeah. The char cloth is cooked. Yeah, it looks good. It's good and dry. It shrinks down a little bit smaller, but it's ready to go. As for Jeffrey's buns. So we're going to take the cinnamon buns still in the oven. Still cooking, eh? Do they value uh, voyageurs that could sing more than other voyageurs? Well, yes. The, the one who would lead the song would be paid a little bit more. And did they, uh, were they good at saving their money? <laughs> <laughs> Almost never. They, in fact, they, uh, the gentlemen used to write each other's letters saying that, gracious, if all the voyageurs could get themselves out of debt, the company would be in ruin the next year. Because <laughs> the men, uh, that's sort of how things worked, is that you were paid so much money, but you could take whatever you like out of the company shops on credit. So if you kept yourself really good in debt, all of the money the company is paying you is going back into buying company goods. And that's always on a high profit margin. So in the big scheme of things, you're not really paid that much at all. The flag on our canoe is that of the Northwest Company, which in the 19th century was merged with the better known Hudson's Bay Company. The fur trade involved many parts of Canadian society. Native Americans trapped the beaver, the voyageurs were French, while the bosses, the gentlemen, were Scottish and English. Arete! Cold water, please. Let's just back up here into the cove a little bit and we'll take a break. Allume tout le monde. Drum roll. No, oh, cinnamon roll. Ooh. Ah. Nice buns, Jeff. Do you, you have one, Michael? Yeah, I do. Oh, okay. Wow. This is awesome. This rest stop turns into more of a bun break than a pipe break. And now it's just a few more miles to our second overnight camp on Jarvis Bay. Start of our third and last day on the lake. Derrière chez nous, y a un étang en roulant ma boule. Le fils du roi s'en va chassant. Rouli roulant ma boule, roulant en roulant ma boule, roulant en roulant ma boule, en roulant ma boule, roulant en roulant ma boule. Le fils du roi. Now even I'm joining in the singing though it doesn't seem to do much for my paddling rhythm. Chris tells me I can now call myself a milieu. That's French for the guy stuck in the middle of the boat. The voyager starts off as milieu, which is anybody behind Sean, all the way back to Peter. So, uh, And these canoes, there's quite a few milieu. Um, but pretty much the milieu are the backbone of the canoe, you, the, pretty much the grunt. After five or six years as a milieu, an experienced, reliable paddler could get promoted to where Sean sits in the bow, the Avant, who's responsible for setting the pace and looking out for obstacles. After uh, another five, six years of doing that, and the position becomes open, you move back to where Peter's sitting at the back, which is the Gouverneur. And that's also more money, less work, and uh, more responsibility. It's 
Superior is calm today, so we venture away from the shelter of the shoreline to spend the night at one of this Voyager crew's favorite camps on an island off the mouth of Thunder Bay. For me, my brother Tommy, and the Peaks, it's our last night as Voyagers. This lake has many faces. Uh, tonight it's showing us a, a, a beautiful one. That's a huge part of our charm. You appreciated today's glassiness extra because yesterday was so tough. Well, it sure gives you a new appreciation for uh, how much hard work it was getting back and forth, because paddling all day. Everyone gets along really well when everyone paddles at the same stroke. <laughs> yeah, but actually, yes, I, think, I was meaning to talk to you guys about that. Yeah, yeah. We were, really you were the only one in that. stroke, and everyone, everyone else, else was out. is upside uh, down. Yeah. And we do, on behalf of the crew, I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> What is it that gets you guys so excited about the Voyager way of life? In a lot of ways, the, the Canadian fur, fur trade is representative of a lot of things that are um, Canadian. It's, it's a huge effort in cooperation, you know, native people, uh, French and English all working together. That's why the canoe is such a good symbol for all this, because the canoe combines all three, native, French and English, are all interwoven. In, in the canoe. And it fits, oh. it fits perfectly in the Canadian landscape. If you were, take a map of Canada and throw two darts at it, you can put a boat in at one spot and paddle to the other spot. And across the entire country, you never have to walk any more than 13 miles. That's the longest portage historically and modernly across this entire continent. I and mean, for me, it's like get to live the social life as a voyager as well. And I really like those evenings around the fire and when people sing or dance. I feel it in my bones, so and being out here on a night like this makes a very special place in your heart. À la claire fontaine, m'en allant promener, j'ai trouvé l'eau si belle que je m'y suis baigné. Fendez le bois, chauffez le four, Levé, levé, tout le monde, time to get up. You gotta get on the lake before the wind comes up. A good night sleeping under the canoe, dreaming of wolves and paddle strokes. I've come to appreciate how idyllic the voyager's life must have been, yet how exhausting it really was. Up before dawn, to bed long after sunset, and in between, miles and miles of endless blue. As Sean, Peter, and the others paddle into the morning calm, I thought of that Voyager painting hanging back in my office, and I realized I'd never look at it quite the same way again. To learn more about Any Place Wild in the Great Outdoors, check out PBS online at www.